Welcome to the Totally Awesome Outdoors Show. Now then, outdoors, we used to live as cavemen, didn't we? Just on the outside of the cave and have fires in there. And now, do you know, it's almost coming full circle. The huge expense of heating your house. Electric, gas, heating oil, you name it, whatever it is, I've got all three here, three different bills, a lot of people have that obviously, is you can't be having either an open fire or outside with a brazier if you're working outside, which is like a mesh one, heats the uh, heats, heats all the wood up outside, or better still a log burner. Now, for people who are just moving into the countryside or into the edge of towns where they do allow fires in chimneys, I hasten to add, in a full proper chimney, well, they think, where am I gonna get all this wood from to burn? Well, where do they think it comes from? Do they think it grows on trees? Well, actually it does grow on trees, but, one place you can get them is industrial estates. You go around and you can get some pallets. Now those pallets are what I call seasons. It's up to you to dry them. But they've probably been all around the world over a number of years on different ships and different containers. China, Australia, South America, New York, who knows, all around the world. So they've been traveled, they've been seasoned. They're really, really good for burning. I'll show you in a minute how to nip them down and how to make really good kindling wood out of them. Because you've got to start the base of any fire with very fine strips of kindling wood. However, how else would you go and get some wood? Obviously, logs. Now, you can't just go whizzing trees down, cutting them down willy-nilly. You need permission. Even on your own land, you might have what's called a TPO, which is a tree preservation order put on it by the area council, which is extremely expensive to be cut down. Over here in the UK, I think it's something like a $20,000, $20,000 fine. It's a big lump. It's a lot of fires, put it that way. So be very careful. Perhaps ask permission of somebody if you can cut wood on their land. They might have some dead wood, they might want something trimming. So what tools do you need? Well, trust me, it's worth investing in the tools because the last time I had a load of logs delivered, it cost 80 pounds. And the guy just threw them in the back of a pickup, some logs, commercially, obviously commercially done. <coughs> threw them on the ground. I looked at it and I thought, well, that's not gonna last me more than a few weeks. So rather than pay 80 pounds again, get burned second time round, I thought, for £60, I can buy an electric chainsaw. Well, that opens up a whole new world of one, exercise, two, free wood. These are some of the other tools you're going to need if you're going to collect your own wood. Now then, saw-wise, you can either cut largest pieces of uh, timber up with either a petrol or an electric-powered chainsaw. Now, I'm not going to go deeply into chainsaws because they should have a whole program on their own and they come with directions, the basics of which, if you're moving it around, keep the chain guard on all the time. You have an adjuster down there. Do not have the chain very tight and it binds, it will seize up, it might snap and something disastrous happens. Also, do not have it loose. You want a little bit of play, just a little bit of play there. It will tell you how many millimetres of play to have in the chainsaw when you buy the chainsaw within the directions. It runs on its own chainsaw oil, which you fill up here. Electric or petrol, either way, it doesn't make any difference. It's got to run, it's got to have oil for the chain, and that is important to keep it topped up. Do not let them run dry. Constantly after you cut, six or eight cuts, I'd say, just check that blade. If it's electric, switch the power off before you go anywhere near it. Just check that blade. Okay, <clears throat> that will cut down a full tree. It will also cut down enough to make logs. So there you go, chainsaws. They have a safety kick guard here for kickback, just at the front here. Read the directions. And also, I always wear a really thick pair of welding gloves. Now, they might be deemed a little bit cumbersome, but if there is any chain break or anything like that, it might just give me... I might be able to play the piano still, might not. You know, instead of being walking home like, Mum, bit of an accident with a chainsaw today. We don't want any of that at all. So read the directions on chainsaws. They are dangerous, they do a good job. Make sure you're fully trained in it. Even take a course if you have to. Now for noisy decibel items, like chainsaws, electrical, petrol or other saws, you're gonna need something to protect your ears. So get yourself a good, a good pair of ear defenders. These ones I think are for shooting, actually. They're really, really good. And they really good and they're cheap so get those as well for for wood or timber about up to four inches in diameter which is basically a lot of what I do 
and certainly for breaking down a pallet, cutting it down, I use a standard, what they call reciprocating saw, which is basically a saw blade here, which I'll get that one out, probably can't get it out, I can't, my fingers are so cold today. You can buy these off the internet, replacement of saw blades, they just drop in, you've got a little locking key with them, like that, they lock it, and they saw backwards and forwards, it beats the heck out of doing it by hand, they are excellent and very, very good. Use them carefully and, again, common sense redirections. Now, once you've got them into log size, you've cut your log, your timbers into sections. You obviously could burn them whole, but they will burn better if you break them down in size. For that, we need some more tools. Okay, for smaller items, a variety of axes. Small ones being what I would call almost a hatchet size. Very, very cheap to buy, quite heavy in the back, and you can see they're very thick at the back. In a variety of sizes, it's a very, very old one, and it's very slim through here, and really comfortable. It's got a little kick up at the end of the handle, so, so you, 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 the smaller your hand, the little finger is not going to slide off like that, we hope. Now, when you're swinging any form of an axe, please do not wear anything woolen. If you're in a cold country and you're wearing gloves, do not do it. You need, you really need leather, a proper, well, a gripping glove. Sometimes you can look and get those neoprene rubber ones. You do not want wool, it will slip and slide. Better still, if you can, bare hands, bit of spit, and that gives you the grip, and you can really whack into it, and that grips on the edge there. Also use a larger size one, which will chop through easier, but it will also require more power because it is heavier. But try not to fight and struggle with them, just lift them up and let the weight of the axe do the cutting for you. For splitting down to make kindling wood, I'll show you in a second when I've broken that pallet down, I use one of these. You can call it a cleaver, you can call it a hatchet, whatever you want to call it, there's different names in different countries. Got a little hook on the end as well, and again, it curves out here, it's just standard on a lot of axes and cutting tools, it just stops your hand sliding off. It's like a little trigger, a sort of trigger grip in reverse there, it just goes on a on your finger there. You can just chop away, I'll show you how to do that in a minute. And my grandmother's way of doing it, old school, was with small thin pieces of wood to split them down so they burn faster in an open fire. She used a regular old kitchen knife, but blunt, not sharp. I'll show you how to do that. The other thing, if you're making kindling wood, and this is for making the kindling wood, use a ball. Don't just chop it straight on the concrete floor because as the axe follows through, or the cleaver, follows through, it's going to constantly chip chunks out the floor, won't do the axe any good, uh, won't do your floor any good either. Just get a piece of scrap wood, and in this case I've got a board, and that's what I'm going to show you in a minute how I'm going to do that. But you can also split your logs down with much bigger axes. Okay, two full-on big size axes here. One is your standard axe, which as you can see there, is very, very narrow, very slim, okay, but it has that same curved up almost like a salmon kite. If you see a, a male salmon in, uh, when he's running up the river to spawn, it has his hook up kite, and that gives you the grip there. If I'm right-handed, so a bit of spit on the left hand, and I can swing it right over like that, or I can indeed come down the side. This one you could use for chopping down trees, let's say up to about 16 inches. If you're out somewhere, you can carry this with you, and if you haven't got the chainsaw, you haven't got petrol, you haven't got electric, you can obviously carry an axe. Old school, it works, it's hard work. Again, we're gonna sharpen the edge of this, put it on the grinder, and I'll show you how to sharpen it, get a nice, good edge on it. That's a cutting axe. That's what we call it, a cutting axe. But the other one, although it looks like a cutting axe, you'll think it's the same. Ooh, it's not the same, trust me. That, as you can see, looks like an axe from the actual blade end, but at the other end, but I've moved forward to hold it, very, very, very thick, solid steel, very heavy. You can actually drive stakes in with this on the reverse, hammer, hammer down stakes if you're doing fencing with the back of that. But this, this one is for splitting logs down. You will not split logs very well with a standard cutting axe. You need a log splitter, so you need two axes, one to chop it down and two to split it into usable sizes. Again, we'll show you, this has got a nice rubberized grip to it, you see, don't use wool gloves, they slide, they're dangerous. Now this one, you just let the weight of the axe do it, the momentum drive through. If you try and do it too hard, you go right through the wood, 
right through the piece of safety block you've got, you'll end up in Brisbane in Australia if you do it too hard. There's a lot of weight to that one, and we're gonna show you those as well. First, let's, I'll show you how to whiz a pallet down quickly. Now the best size Kindergood you can make, I would say will be about six inches long, because that will go through with a little knife, which I'll show you how to do that in a minute, or better still, with a cleaver or a small axe, you can strip it up. If you go any longer than that, you'll find that your first stroke will probably jam, and then you've got to keep bashing with the same one, trying to get it through the wood. Makes hard work. That's about the size that you want, just six inches. If you can get it without knots, great. I wouldn't split the ones with knots in, it makes hard work. Just put them aside, burn them as they are. Okay, here we go. I've got to cut them down into small sections here, right? Now, when you're cutting them, you, don't, you want to avoid, if you can, that piece there. Because if you're going to put that down and then attempt to chop it, it's going to kick over like this. So all those flat bits, might try and get them dead flat, dead even, so that you know, the wood sits down dead flat. Now, I'm going to be using this one, which is a like a cleaver. And all I do is mind your fingers and mind things like knots there. I'll do this one so just to show you. I'm just going to bump it with about the first third of the cutting of the blade just there, just to nick it. That's all it takes, just there. Just like just one bump. Now that's going to be kindling wood size for starting fires. You don't, I don't, you could wear gloves if you wanted, I guess I don't like wearing gloves. I like just running them down like this. You're not taking a great big swing, you're just bumping it. And you're using, again, you're using the weight of this steel to take it down. You can even turn it the other way. And I bump it at a slight angle just to nick it. You can see it holding there like that. And then using the weight of it, so easy, doesn't bear thinking of even short bits. Now there's a knot there. It just, see, if I can show you that, look how that's angled over because of that tiny little piece of wood. You do not want that kicking off the blade. So either do it that way out, or just knock that, that piece off. You want it standing still. Those you can do with your hand away. Just like that, just split them down. It seems incredibly easy, but a lot of people still go and buy all their kindling wood. You can shave it as thin as you want there. Maybe two mil, three mil thick. Whatever you want. You are of course governed, you're governed by the grain in the wood that you get from the pallets. But pallet wood does make very, very good kindling wood. There we go. We're just working away. I can do it relatively quickly, but quick means accident so watch your fingers if you if you notice as soon as I got that first take there my hands away I'm just using the weight of the axe there I can, I can basically hit as hard as I want you know if I wanted to do it I'll do it in one but I find it more accurate more safe just to tap it the other way you can do it is with a knife a blunt knife like this and just put it between your knees and you're just going to rock it from side to side, pushing hard. There we go, I heard it go. Look how thin that goes. Now that was Graham's way of doing it. I know, because I helped to do it. Running it down like this on a piece of wood with a blunt knife, leaning with your arms locked over the top, pushing down, popping it off. Again, depends, just rock it side to side to break the grain. Once that grain's been broken, I can do it almost thumb and hand pressure, split straight down, and it makes very, very fine slivers of kindling wood for you. There. You're not going to get much finer than that, and that's beautiful. All we a little bit of labour intensive, so I'm going to whack away with my hatchet here. Now look, that's barely, barely five minutes of just messing around, showing you with the camera. And once you get into a rhythm of this, you can get through almost a sackful of this stuff. 
so I wouldn't advise her buying it. Look there, I would expect to get from a few minutes' work two burns out of that, two starts to a fire. So there you go. Two ways of splitting kindling wood with a cleaver. You can even use a small axe. You can use a small axe, but what I find is you've got a very small area there, you know, to, to, to meet the piece of wood with. It's a small area. Let's look at the cleaver. You've got one, two, it's three times as big. The knife is one, twice as big, much easier to use. I personally stick to these two for making my kindling wood. Okay, so when you get to use the bigger axe, the next size up, we're going up from the boys to the men's size. Right, you've got your larger pieces like this, say could be four by two, three by two, could be leftover pieces of timber, off cut some work you've got, it could be leftover spars of the pallet, anything. If you put them on the fire that size, unless you've got a huge log burner, they will burn, but the more air you can put between this wood, in other words, splitting it down again, it will burn so much better. The same principle applies. Use one piece for the shock, like that board, put your other piece on top, like, like so, line it up so it's nice and straight, and the weight of the axe is just gonna fall straight on the middle there. Keep your legs away. You don't want to be following through anywhere. Knees, feet, arms, legs. What you're looking to do is to follow there and go right to here. In your mind, you're gonna follow through. Again, make sure there's no tag-ins there. You want it, don't hold your hands on it like this. Make sure it's flat. Make sure it's, 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 it's balanced perfectly flat. Take a line on it. My God, how easy was that? I barely hit that, and I could probably take it down again. Another side, just, that will burn really well if you can get that into three. I'm just tapping it, you have to take my word for it, just tapping it. And this is just a regular axe you can get from most hardware, ironmongers. One point I will say, make sure there's no nails in it, because if, if, you, if you get a nail on any form of saw or axe, it's going to take the edge off it. Right, so that's the kindling wood. That's a block with an axe, which you can do inside or outside. Let's get out, have a go with a larger size log splitting axe, and I'll show you how to get those big logs split in two for drying out. When you're using a grinding wheel of any description, you're going to get sparks, so do make sure that you don't have any open canisters or flammable liquid. Now, on the axe head like this, I want to cut, I'm putting what I call a fairly shallow uh, cut on this one, not steep, I want it to cut through and I want it to split. So I'm just trying to take it along the edge there, put an edge on it, but for the actual log splitting axe, which is much heavier, I'm gonna put a little bit of a steeper angle on it because I'm not too worried about the, the sort of cutting action. It's got so much power in the weight of that steel head. It's gonna carry it through and obviously, you can see it's wide at the top. I want it to spread the wood and split. So just do both sides. It doesn't take more than a couple of minutes to do. Grind away there, and you can do this with all your axes, your cleavers. Just be careful, just watch what you're doing, and always make sure that you switch all the electrical appliances in your workshop off when you leave. Here you can see it's a nice sharp edge to this axe. Now of course if you hit a stone, if you hit a nail in a piece of wood or a tree or fence post, it's going to mess it up, but you can always grind it off again. The main thing you want to do with logs is you've got to have a good shocking area, a good pillar, and you use a sawn off piece of another piece of timber to do that on. And I've got that with a slab of concrete underneath, you know, a paving slab. So that absorbs a lot of the shock and you'll find that it splits the logs a lot better. I'll show you the two axes in action. Okay, now this one, as I said, is the cutting axe. I'm just gonna take a swing at this here, and it might go through and it might not. No. I'll give it another go. Now you can see what it does. It cuts into it, but it doesn't have the momentum to go right through that. Always twist them when you get them out, and I'll show you now. The big bad boy, the locks, the log splitting axe. A lot of momentum, a lot of power with this. You just let it fall, let it follow through, and it should absolutely cleave that in one go. 
as you can see there, so much momentum, it's fired both bits of wood across either side and I've gone into the other piece. A lot less effort, a lot less power required to cut woods with that one. Now you can split that down again. You basically just let the weight of all this here, several pounds of steel, fall, almost fall onto it. Straight through, no problem at all. Now here's a harder piece. You can just hold it over the top and it splits it completely in two. I can't emphasize enough the fact that log splitting with a log splitting axe is really all about using the weight, the momentum of that big steel head to do the work for you. All you want to do is retain your accuracy. Do not do it when you're tired. I've obviously said it before, don't use gloves. Try and use your bare hands if you can. If not, a nice rubberized grip glove, test it first. And you'll really enjoy doing it. It's good exercise. You're getting really, you know, the best wood you can get. And what I also do is I make a range of sawn off stumps here that I use for, if you like, slabs, just to put my uh, uh, logs on to split, or a workhorse, what we call a sawing horse. Now, I wouldn't saw this piece, I just put it there to show you. But that's a sawing horse, I rest my branches in there, and trees, and I can cut them down, and this is what you get at the end, either three or four inches across, I just store them together with the larger ones, which are split down. The drier the log, the better the burn. Easy, nice to remember that. And it would be handy if I could find one that could saw down trees as well. The other thing to do is when you finish doing all your all your wood cutting make sure all your cutting implements are clean and dry when you put them away. Make sure with axes that your heads are totally secured. Some are epoxy handles you know they're absolutely like a welded nylon that's inside there like the big axes here. They come totally sealed in on the end so they're rigid check them though, because every so often you might miss cutting over a stump and actually hit the shaft, especially with the older wood ones, and they come with a wedge in there that you drive in, it splits the wood apart and it pinches into the head. Always, always check them. But finally, what you want to do is when you clean them off, get something what's called a barrier shield, and you spray it over the axe heads. Any metal covering is good, inhibits rust, makes it last better, makes it look nicer, and they'll cut well next time. Just cover them with this. That's a barrier shield there. And it really does look after anything metal. And then you won't get so much rust build up on your cutting edge there. You can take it straight out and use it. There you go. Ready to put away, ready for use the next time round. Well, there you go, some good tips for you for log cutting. But we've actually gone from this, which are the pallet wood, over to this, which is the pallet wood, stripped down, cut into strips, and then down to our kindling wood so we can start the fire. The beams, the supports, we haven't wasted, they've gone from here. We split them down with a medium axe to this side for your fire. And then we've gone to the logs as well, the standard logs. That should give you some tips for cutting your own wood, but what do you do for storing it other than when it's in a shed? I recommend using these large ooh, wicker baskets, and you can keep all your wood in there, and the wicker sides here allow it all to breathe. You do not want to put them in plastic bags. If you put them away wet, they will sweat. They won't burn right. So get yourself a wicker basket, and this will be ready for the next night's burn. Thanks for watching the Totally Awesome Outdoor Show. Hope you got some tips there. And don't forget, if you're an outdoors person, you're eventually you're going to go fishing. If you want fishing tips, look over at our sister channel, the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. Thanks for watching.